so let me just begin by welcoming you all. Thank you again for joining us for part four of our uh, series uh, that we've entitled Pathways. And we're, we're talking about here in this final, uh, final part of the series, how we can uh, continue to have a better, wit better Christian witness on the subject of race. Um, as we begin tonight, I wanted to uh, share uh, just a, a brief scripture um, from Galatians chapter 3, when the Apostle Paul writes, For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. And I love uh, the beautiful invitation that uh, no matter our race, no matter our background, no matter our gender, that we ultimately do find our unity in Christ. And um, I think that will be, uh, that will continue to be not only distinctive in terms of how we uh, view um, any issue in our world, um, but particularly the issue of race, um, to see that everyone is truly made in the image of God and to be able to, um, out of what we believe from that, from the very core, um, to be able to look and to see uh, one another through God's eyes, um, even as we know that sadly we often are looking out into a broken world. Um, so grateful again to have Dr. Baycoat with us. Uh, and as we begin tonight, would you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you that we are all created in your image, that we all, uh, no matter our background, no matter the color of our skin, find our identity in you. And so I pray that you would bless our conversation tonight. We thank you for Dr. Baycoat and for his uh, leading us through this series uh, to be better informed and to be inspired as we might uh, seek to be peacemakers, uh, to bring about uh, uh, justice in a greater way, particularly as uh, we think deeply about um, race in our culture, in our church. So bless our conversation tonight and our work in the days ahead that we would uh, move forward with uh, boldness and with uh, joy, knowing that you call us uh, to the greatest fulfillment uh, in Christ we pray. Amen. Well, uh, Dr. Baco, thanks again for joining us and I will um, turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks again to everyone for showing up for this. I appreciate it. I appreciate very much being invited to, to uh, talk about this. Of course, you know, talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for technology as much as, but of course we would all wish we were in the same room, but that's, you know, pandemic reality uh, for us. Um, but with this technology, I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to uh, have these four weeks with you. So I appreciate it very much. And I hope this has been helpful and constructive for you. Um, so what we've been doing, uh, just as a reminder, is um, talking about things you already believe and confess at First Presbyterian and how those things open up ways towards addressing this stubborn conundrum of race. Uh, so uh, this evening, I think I mentioned this last week, I'm going to talk a little bit about the great ends of the church and how some of what is in the great ends of the church, how that uh, helps us also be oriented towards addressing questions of race. Before that, uh, uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, I do I, th this being our last evening together, I want to make sure that I really do make possible at least 30 minutes of conversation for everyone. I realize that some of you, you may laugh and you have good reason for laughing, uh, but my, my aspiration, and that's the word I think I've used every week, my aspiration is to hand it over to the question time by the time the clock hits 7.30. Now, we'll see, you say, I understand, but, well, I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. So first, first that piece. Uh, then I, I, I want to note uh, this at the beginning, because I think it's helpful for us to think about our overall approach to these kinds of issues. Um, some of you 
may have uh, tuned in at eight o'clock last night for something that was advertised as a presidential debate. Uh, and of course, uh, it was um, uh, an evening no one will ever forget. Uh, and uh, one of the things that happened during that debate that has been very um, much subject of conversation has been uh, the president's response to Chris Wallace's question about, are you going to condemn white supremacy? So something I want to observe about that moment uh, and then the, the, the reception of that and the dissemination of ways people have received what was said. So Chris Wallace asked him, you know, are you going, are you willing to condemn white supremacy, et cetera? Now, uh, it's important to note that Trump first said, yes, I'm willing to do that. Uh, and then it turned into, you know, a very um, mishmashy kind of thing. What do you want me to say? Name somebody, et cetera. Then Biden mentioned Proud Boys. And then, and then he, you know, Trump did say, um, step back and, and stand by, I think is what he said, or stand down and stand by. Um, and so a lot of people have been saying, did he really say that, et cetera, et cetera. So here's, here's the thing. I have a lot of problems with our president. And I think he plays dog whistle politics all the time. Uh, one of the difficult challenges about talking about race in general is making sure we're actually honest about what people are saying uh, and honest about what they intended to say or what they did not intend to say. Um, and, you know, I don't usually tell people who I vote for, but I'm probably not voting for him. Let's put it that way. So having said that, with that lead in, I, I do want to also say that um, I don't know what he actually thinks about that. I, th I think he, in the moment, um, when he said stand back, uh, stand down and stand by, I'm not sure that that's really what he meant actually because of what, what happened in the flow of that conversation. Uh, because it's in the moment, there was all this confusion, et cetera, and he was already just all over the place to begin with. And my point is this, I don't know what he thinks about the Proud Boys, et cetera. I do think it's a problem that he doesn't uh, zealously condemn, um, you know, uh, white supremacist groups and that he quickly pivoted to Antifa, et cetera, going to his strategy, et cetera. But I do also want to be um, sure about, well, what was he actually trying to say? Um, and, I think that one of the things that can happen is when we have any kind of conversation that is a, a testy one, and one where we really care about it, uh, it can be easy for us to say, see what he said, and then think that we know exactly what he meant. I mean, the thing that I think Donald Trump means, uh, I mean, I'm not here mainly talking about politics of Donald Trump, I'll put this out there. The main thing I think Donald Trump cares about is Donald Trump. He's like narcissist in chief. That's what I think he is, okay? And it, wow, and that's being recorded, but I've said it elsewhere. Um, and my point is this, is that um, I think he, whatever he says serves his ultimate interest for whatever is gonna elevate him and his own personal aspirations. Uh, so uh, if he was a liberal and he could do that, I think he would be that way. If he was a conservative to do that, he'll be that way. I think that's, that's the way he does things. In the service of all that, I think um, he, always says all kinds of things and maybe means 50% of it. So I don't know what he really thinks and what is actually an exercise in utility for him. Uh, but, and, and in light of that, I guess what I would say is that it's entirely possible that, you know, he'll walk back some of that and maybe actually meant to walk back. I don't know. We'll see what they do. But I think it's important to not presume a moment like that automatically tells you everything about what Trump thinks about those groups in, as compared to what he thinks about his personal strategy. And, sim and likewise, when we're talking about race, so things get tense and nervous and people say all kinds of stuff. And one of the biggest challenges when people are saying all kinds of stuff is to really be clear about what do pe are people actually trying to say? What are they actually trying to communicate? Are they trying to communicate how they feel about something? Are they trying to communicate confusion? Are they trying to seek clarity? Um, are they really expressing what their feelings are in the moment more than what the facts are about a particular situation in the moment? All those things 
you know, combine together often to create, I think, confusing communication around difficult issues uh, around race. And when you really care about something, um, and I certainly care about uh, the rise of white supremacist groups in the United States of America. Um, I do want people to do things about that, but I also don't want my concern about that and other and whatever negatives I may have toward negativity I may have toward the president. I don't want that to be um, done in a way where just because he said something and perhaps didn't say it, say what he intended to say, that I just jump on that and I meme that or I use that to my advantage because, um, because I think he's a racist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are plenty of other things that Donald Trump has said, and I'm pretty sure he means them. I'm happy to say those things. What he said last night, I'm not so sure about that. And so my point is that when you're talking about race and you're talking about difficult things, let's be really clear about what, what did you actually mean to say? Is that actually what you meant to say? Be willing to ask questions about, are you really, is, is that what you really meant to say here? I wanna be sure that there's clear communication here. Because very often the communication is not clear because there's so many things going on. There's information, there's emotions, there's concerns, there's history, there's personal history, personal feelings, uh, and frustrations, et cetera, et cetera. You take all those things together and it takes a lot of work to be able to have the kind of proper communication as well as then constructive communication that helps us move towards being the kind of people that we ought to be. So, so I'm seizing upon that moment from last night, which, which people have used to say, to, it proves something, to say, I'm not sure it proves anything because, I, because of the way that it occur, occurred in the moment that it occurred. And we, I need to be willing to say that, even if I have other concerns about dog whistle politics around race with other things he says. So I need to be able to, make, to distinguish between those things and just be truthful about, well, maybe that's what he meant, maybe it's not what he meant. Other places, pretty clear, I think I know what he means. And to be willing to say things that way. Similarly, when race, well, what does somebody mean? So for example, I think I mentioned this our first week. If somebody says, um, I think the United States has been a racist country from the start, um, that, is not an easy uh, statement to be sure that you know what someone means when they say that. It's easy to think you know what somebody means when they say that. But really, that's where the inquiry must begin. Tell me more about what you mean by the United States is a racist country from the start, uh, or, or, or for it to be an inherently racist country, et cetera. Well, what does that mean? Because, because I, have, I may have an idea of what I think that means, but if I don't actually ask somebody what's going on when they say that, I might then have all kinds of assumptions about one, what a person actually thinks about the United States of America and whether there's any promise or, or hope for the country. Uh, and second, I may think that they are trying to make certain claims about me in relationship to being a person in this country, because I'm a white, a white person in this country. Um, and I might think that I know exactly what they mean. Chances are that's not going to be uh, easy to discern just by somebody saying, I think we've been a racist country from the start. You've got to ask a whole lot more questions. Say, can you unfold that narrative for me? Because I'm not sure what you mean when you say racist. And the thing is, different people will probably have different points of emphasis if they say that exact same statement. So we have to do the work of inquiring to see what people mean. And a lot of what's happening now uh, is not helping that. Uh, and, I think that and, and, and I think it's part of just the nature of our public discourse right now. Our public discourse right now is very reactionary. It's, um, it uh, is catalyzed by... Um, you know, things becoming viral, so, so something spreads quickly, it catches on, people get excited about it or angry about it uh, and, until the next thing happens. That's not a way to actually arrive at actual understanding of anything. It's a, it's a way to get all amped up emotionally about something. It's not a way to really see what's there. And I think it's important for us to do the work of seeing what is there. One way I've talked about this sometimes is I, I've compared it to 
um, in cinema, there's something called a long take. Uh, so if any of you saw the film 12 Years a Slave, uh, there's the hanging scene and the whipping scene. There are two examples of this. In both those scenes, what Steve McQueen, the, the director did was, uh, he has the camera on the action and the, and the shot may get closer in, it may get further away, but it stays on that action. And it doesn't leave the action for a long time, like several minutes. And with the whipping scene, for example, you are just sitting here watching this horror happen and the camera does not take its eye off. And you have to kind of stay there or run out of the theater. Those are your two choices. Uh, and I think we actually have to be willing to do long takes uh, because when there's a long take, you can't help but actually begin to pay attention to not just what's immediately there, but what else is going on there. And to, and to be involved in this sort of long take perspective means I'm willing to dive into things, but I'm also willing to take the time to do what is necessary, to see what is there, to understand what is there. So I think a long take type of disposition is very important if we're going to be able to have the kind of communication that will be important to move forward uh, towards, for example, you know, uh, you know, First Presbyterian being a community where everybody says, you know what, they're really good at listeners and inquirers at First Presbyterian because, because they're, they, they don't want, before they move, they want to be sure they know what, what they're talking about. They want to be sure they know about what's there. And so they're doing the work to see what's there. But to do that work, you have to take your time. And sometimes it's a longer time. Uh, so we have to be willing to do that. I think it, 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 it's really important. Otherwise, I think um, we wind up having a kind of reactionary uh, posture and um, approach to things. And I don't think that that's in the long term the most helpful uh, or constructive. Um, let me say a few things about the great ends of the church because I've got eight minutes based on my <laughs> promise. Um, uh, so I'm going to read the great ends of the church. The great ends of the church are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and the spiritual fellowship of the children of God maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. Now, uh, a good exercise to do uh, that I'm not going to attempt now with eight minutes to go uh, is to think about how each one of these phrases themselves opens up a trajectory towards how we address race. I am going to talk about two or three of these, and then um, it'll be time for us to talk. Um, so let's talk about where it says, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the kingdom of God. So if, if that's part of the end of the church, the purpose of the church, why a church is doing what it does, um, what does it mean to really be the shelter, nurture, a place of shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship uh, for the children of God? What, one of the things that that means is, is that uh, First Presbyterian is saying that it is a home for the children of God, right? A place of care, a place of formation and sustenance, and a place of actual community. I think one of the biggest challenges in uh, any, any community when people are dealing with questions of race is for a community, be, community to be a place where people really say, that's my home. And they know that's their home. I've mentioned this before, I think, but I want to reiterate that because I think one of the biggest challenges, if you, if you want to think about what, what, what can First Presbyterian do, um, you can work on assessing whether you're really home for um, all the people that you want to be home for. Which means thinking about, well, if somebody comes here, what are they seeing? What are they perceiving? What are they hearing? What kinds of interactions are they having with people? What, what kinds of things say to them, um, you really are our family rather than you're just a visitor? 
what what's going on in all the different things that 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 you do as a congregation. Now, mind you, I think I said this also. The point isn't to try to become all things to all people culturally because nobody can do that. But what does it mean for First Presbyterian, being the, the church that it is, to make itself more of a place where it really is a home for everyone? So that um, if you have, you know, let's say you have a couple of families that are cradle Presbyterians that are African Americans that move to Wheaton and they come to your church, um, what is it going to be about your church that when they get there, they go, these are my people? Not just because of what they confess, but because, in a sense, what, what's the ethos there that tells them this is their home, that they belong there, right? And that um, they belong there not just as people who you're glad to have occupy space, but they're people that you want to worship, serve, and to be vital contributors to the community. It's a great question to ask, right? And, 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 and every, every community has to do this, I think. So. That's one thing with uh, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God. Um, the preservation of the truth. Now, the preservation of the truth includes being sure that you know what all the truth is. So I think there has to be the willingness to say, if we're people who, who are committed to the preservation of the truth, well, what do we mean when we say we're preserving the truth? What, what are the truths we want to make sure we hold on to? But also, what truths that perhaps we confess um, are really more an exercise in abstraction rather than um, what actually gets put into practice where, where we are. Uh, because when you say truth, well, truth about what? So if it's, if it's truth about the two greatest commandments, love, love of God and neighbor, um, well, how committed are you to being a, peop a people who, in your love of God, and, and the truth is connected to the love of God, um, that really means that, um, for example, somebody says, you know what's distinctive about First Presbyterian? They are very fierce in tracking down the idols in their congregation, including idols about racial and ethnic, uh, you know, preference, right? And the thing, and the thing about, about idols of racial and ethnic preference is that they don't always seem like idols. They just kind of seem like part of the family. For everybody, this is this is the way it is, right? So we, we have to ask ourselves, well, are there things that are happening that are making me, um, without perhaps intending it, but preferring us racially and ethnic, ethnically and everybody else is not quite like us. Everybody has to ask that question um, because uh, we've all probably been in situations where uh, if we did not do it ourselves, we have relatives or friends who, um, talk about other ethnic groups in ways where you're very sure that there's something about them that really deserves uh, the complaints that you want to spew for, right? Or, or the criticisms that you want to state. Um, so I, th I think if, if you're a place that is really saying uh, we, we worship God above all, you have to be willing to smoke out the way that there can be idolatries of racial and ethnic pride. Right? I think I think that that's a very important thing to be willing to do, uh, and it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, there's a friend of mine. I'm, I can't remember if I mentioned this, but but I'm going to mention it again in case I did. He lives uh, in the Shenandoah Valley area, I think it is, in Virginia, uh, in a kind of a rural setting, and uh, he's in a town where they were going to, where they decide to remove some Confederate statues. Um, so, so it's great that they did that, but in a lot of his conversations that he had with people in that area uh, and, learn, and learning about some things that his son had been hearing about in high school from his peers, and his friend's wife, by the way, um, he, he said to me that he reached the conclusion that a lot of people just basically uh, have a belief in white supremacy. Not necessarily as in like, hoods and swastikas, but just that there's something better about being white than being anything else. Uh, and, and, and a certain conception of that being Southern whites. Uh, and, and, the, and, 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 uh, you know, when I, when I heard this, I was, I was actually very surprised that he actually uh, said this, but, but I use this example just to say that 
he was willing to actually, as a result of his engagement, say, I think this is really what's going on. And the point is, if you're committed to preserving the truth, and, and if, if you say part of your truth is about God being first above all uh, and no idols, um, are you willing to smoke out the idols? You know, and, and there are idols of, of, of racial and ethnic pride. And the thing is, by the way, sometimes they're very nice people. Innocent. I'm not saying actual human beings, but the idols are like nice people, but they seem so friendly. They don't really think anything bad about people. Well, they don't appear to, right? But they do actually subtly say, um, as uh, you know, in animal forms, some are more equal than others, right? Uh, so we have to be will willing to do uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the next line, uh, the promotion of social righteousness. So, um, which could, some people could say, oh, that seems like social justice. Yes, I think that would be a fair thing to say. Um, and I would only say about that, uh, just be willing to be people to recognize that any engagement in our social interactions, where we want that interaction to be reflecting the righteousness of God uh, and, and to do what's due to people, hence justice, um, to have the courage to not be thrown off by people that um, sound alarms about the specter of um, some kind of red scare showing up in your church because there's a lot of conversation uh, about that right now, um, just because of using the term social justice. So I, I think a commitment to social righteousness requires, one, actually be willing to say, at this church, uh, we're not just people who care about a vertical relationship with God, but it's horizontal expression towards all people, which means commitment to seeking the good of all. Uh, which means uh, obviously justice for all, flourishing for all. And so is, is, is that really what, what, what you want to be known for? And then the last thing, uh, the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. The only thing I wanna say about this is, sometimes when people say the phrase exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world, some people get nervous. They think that to have a commitment to the kingdom and want to display that, that, that means that you want to take over the world when you talk about the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. It's an exhibition that really is um, a grand takeover plan. I'm not saying that anybody in your congregation thinks this, but sometimes people read language like that and they think, oh, so you're those people who think that you can make the kingdom happen, etc." I think um, the phrase is fine as it is, uh, but it's important for us to think about the fact that anything we do in our pursuit of displaying the kingdom of heaven around race or anything else is always going to be a work in progress. And it's important to see that it's a work in progress because we can't fully express or establish righteousness or justice in anything that we do, right? That there will be something that's imperfect about it, something that there's something missing uh, or something that might be good in one circumstance, but not good for all circumstances. And so I think it's um, yeah, important for us to uh, have a commitment to displaying the kingdom of heaven, but um, to do that with humility and a great commitment to lots of refinement and revision. And at one level, that, if you're thinking about it that way, that really gives you permission to just try lots of stuff. It's okay. Throw it at a wall. It might not be great. It might be spectacular. It might be something in between. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, so if we know that it's always subject to refinement and revision, and we're thinking about addressing race, then the point then is venture something. Because a lot of times, I think people want to ha venture the perfect thing or the thing that will, will, will solve everything. Nothing's going to be completely solved until Jesus comes back and sets everything right. So everything is going to be a work in progress. So keep working on the work in progress. Keep refining the work in progress. I think that's a way to, to, uh, to go about it, knowing that when you're doing that, 
part of what happens with the exhibition of the kingdom of righteousness, I believe, kingdom of heaven to the world, I think, is to um, is to give something like a little aroma of what's coming in fullness when Jesus comes back. And a little aroma is different than saying, I'm going to give you a perfect expression of what God's kingdom looks like on earth, right? And aroma tells you, hey, there's something here. There's something coming. I don't, I don't quite have the complete sense of what it is, but I do know that there's a something there, right? And it's a something there that's attractive. So I think having that more, uh, thinking about have, being an aroma of the kingdom, uh, or thinking about what I sometimes refer to as like a, a com coming attractions of the kingdom. For the coming attractions, you don't see the whole story. You do see a little something, and it does create a kind of appetite. I think that kind of idea is a way to be able to have uh, an energetic uh, pursuit to exhibit the kingdom of heaven without thinking that that energetic pursuit must be something like the full, perfect expression or establishment of the kingdom. I think that's very important uh, on race or, or, or anything else. So uh, so there's uh, that thought. Okay, la one last thing I actually wanna say, and then I promise questions. Um, so uh, Kellen mentioned Galatians 3.28 at the beginning. Galatians 3.28 is a great text. It's also a great text that sometimes people use to say that we shouldn't think about ourselves and our ethnic particularity. I'm not saying that that's what Kellen said because that's not what he said. So I want to be very clear about that. But I, but I do know that sometimes in conversations about race, people say, no Jew, Greek, slave, free, we're all one in Christ Jesus. Yes, uh, but that's also in a book where Paul wanted to say that there didn't need to be everybody becoming cultural Jews in order to be, be members of the kingdom of God, right? The point is, is that there's people from all these diverse backgrounds that have a unity as a result of Christ, but it is not a unity that obliterates ethnic particularity. So, uh, so the question is, is how do we properly situate our ethnic particularity, which would be in a non-idolatrous way, while we significantly emphasize the primary unity that we have in Christ? Because nothing from our particularity can save us. Our particularity can be a great display of the, the great gifts that God distributes throughout his world to people, uh, but none of those things themselves are the things that are going to deliver you know the fullness of life to anybody so all that comes through christ but jesus doesn't say so get rid of your particularity no we, we properly situate it and we and we thank him for the gifts and abilities that he's given us uh, and, and and things he's given in our culture but we also have gratitude and interest and curiosity about uh the particular gifts that come from others as well from their different ethnic and racial backgrounds all right, so that's a little bit so, so a little bit past seven thirty, but not that much either. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give it to you, Doctor Bate. Pre not not too bad. You're pretty close there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, questions? We would invite you to um, to unmute yourself and ask a question. To um, pose a question in the chat, um, you're invited to do so. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, John. Um, I did some fact checking. <clears throat> President Trump has said a far rights group should stand down and let law enforcement do its work. Uh, that was this afternoon. Okay. okay. And either, either A, he thought more about it and agreed that it wasn't what he really wanted to say or B, and more likely, his inner circle, who we understand got hysterical after the debate last night, pleaded with him to come up with another line. Yeah, 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 thank you. Thanks for, thanks for looking that up. Um, did he uh, did say anything in that story about uh, the new Proud Boys logo that came out immediately after the debate? No, but okay. we've seen it. It's yeah. been on the air. Yeah, okay, all right. So I mean, they certainly took advantage of, of that moment, that's for sure. Yes, they yeah. certainly did. Yeah. Thanks, John.
I guess, uh, Dr. Pigot, why, while folks are contemplating uh, questions they might have, we were talking just for a few minutes before we came on uh, this call about, um, I feel that in conversations I have with folks, you know, a question that ultimately comes up is, um, what can we actually do um, to be um, having a better Christian witness? What can we actually do, uh, practically speaking, um, in terms of actions and things like that? Uh, right. So um, I'm sure you've given thought to that. And, you know, what does it look like for us to have an authentic yeah. witness um, from our perspective, from our situation our, in our congregation? So um, maybe you could just speak, sure. speak to that for a moment. Sure. Uh, one thing I would say is um, to be willing to make it just part of your regular discourse to talk about these kinds of issues, right? And, and, and that, but, but to develop a way of talking about it where it doesn't sound like it's a special issue that you're talking about, that it's just part of a whole in terms of the way that you talk about what it is to live with fidelity to God in his world. Right, so so that the way that you're cultivating discourse among, uh, you know, from you know babes all the way, you know, to to the older adults, is that people are learning to talk about their faith as a faith where it's normative to seek the good of all persons, and when you're seeking the good of all persons, it requires you in our time and place to uh, at least at least in part discuss. Uh, addressing race as part of that, um, but 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 the cultivation of that is a very long process, and the reason I say that is because it's not a simple thing, um, and that uh, uh, I think it, there there it's almost like there needs to be a way where um, you are able to talk about it and it's very explicit what, what you mean when you talk about it. Um, but also where it's clear that when you talk about it, you, you use different vocabulary, that you're also including race in that vocabulary, right? So in other words, sometimes I think a way to get people on board with something is to talk about something and they don't know that you're talking about it, right? So, so I may talk about the words, the words theology and doctrine and never use them, right? I mean, so if I, but if I talk about how important it, it is to understand what we mean when we talk about Jesus or church or eschatology, et cetera. But I never use the words doctrine or theology. Of course, I'm talking, I'm saying stuff about theology and doctrine the whole time and why it's really important to be engaged in all of that. So similarly, I think there's, there's ways to talk about our life together that would clearly have implications for addressing the, the ongoing challenges of race. So, so, so if you're talking about truth telling, well, um, how truthful are people about the ways that they have learned to talk about other people? How truthful are, are they in terms of um, being willing to uh, interrogate their own, uh, well, the, the, you know, just, just the discourse that they've always learned? Are there things you've always said, things you've always thought that you never get second thought to them, but maybe you, you need to uh, actually change that discourse. So are, are you willing to be, become those kinds of people? And it really is, because what we're talking about is a really a lifelong formation process because ever since the fall, what's been more normative for humans is just to antagonize each other around some kind of difference. And so what salvation does is put us in a process where, where it, there's many transformations that take place, including learning how to live with and seek the good of people who are not like us ethnically, geographically, in terms of gender, in terms of class, et cetera. All those things, you know, uh, wind up being all put at the feet, the foot of the cross. So um, to, to, to do that and to do that well is a perpetual process because everything around us tells us to take a more selfish route. Because, because you do have to be willing to, um, uh, 
uh, to learn a lot and willing to be good at saying, I'm sorry and forgive me and I misunderstood. You, you, so you have to have the cultivation of tremendous patience. You have to be, you have to be cultivating a marathon mindset because it's a long game. Uh, I, apart from a big revival that would instantaneously del deliver it to all of us. Hmm. So I think those are some of the things I would say. I'd also say, look at your catechesis, right? What, what's in your catechesis that includes ways that form catechumens or uh, what's one term? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the vocabulary that you use for people go, go, who go to the catechism, but um, how are they learning to engage other people? And how are they learning to interrogate the ways that they just might take for granted that's okay to look down on people for certain reasons? And race being one of those. And you can make assumptions about people on race because of what is fed to you through, you know, the various uh, things that, in, that happen in advertising and other forms of media. Right? Because, because there are a lot of people who might think, oh, I know what black people are like. I said, well, and how many of them do you know? I mean, have, 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 you, have you been around black people in Mississippi and Charleston and Washington, D.C. and New York and L.A.? And we can just keep going on, right? And because you'll discover that those are not the same people. Some things overlap, but oh boy, people in Washington, D.C., okay, are not like people in South Carolina, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And so I can't make those assumptions about people. But I can think because I saw some video or some movie that I know exactly what it is. Or because one pundit told me, and maybe even African-American pundit told me that this black people are like this. It's like, well, you mean there may be a tendency among many African-Americans to be that way. Not all of them. So we, so we have to be willing to do, to do that work. And that's very hard. It's just, it's just easier to just put people in a frame and go, okay. I know what's in the frame. Don't have to do anything else. When really we have to be in a perpetual discernment, perpetual learning kind of mindset. So, so as a congregation, are you cult cultivating perpetual learning, perpetual inquiring? Because I think that's one of the things that has to happen. Um, and what also has to happen is, I think I mentioned this the first week, is uh, a tremendous willingness that takes your information tremendous courage to do this having the courage to be honest about your incompetence on the question of race because i think that's one of the things that gets in the ways of people actually being able to have genuine discourse because if i get nervous about my incompetence my goal my first tendency isn't to say especially me as a professor right i mean my first tendency isn't to say um i don't know or I don't know anything or very little about this. My first tendency is to kind of find some way to present competence and ability to, to manage something. When really, if you're not competent about it, you're not really that good at managing it. So you had to be willing to, to reckon with the incompetence. Um, and that's actually liberating because you can just admit, okay, I, I thought I knew ab about this. It's like, well, there's a lot that we don't know, all of us. Mm -hmm. And, we, and let's, let's just admit that. Um, while knowing that, you know, in terms of what First Presbyterian teaches, all, you know, all, all the different things we talked about, the values, you know, what, what, what the, the, the membership questions, the ends of the church, all of those things orient you towards a life with God that, that if you if we look at the fullness of what it entails leads us unavoidably to addressing the ways that race has been a way that humans have been antagonized on the basis of this fiction called um, racial categorization. Thanks for that, um, Dr. Pecote. Other uh, questions, comments, responses that you want to put in the chat or, or you're welcome to unmute yourself and, uh, and ask live. I 
I think one of the things that that really perplexes me and makes me sad is the question, do I have an authentic relationship? Have I ever had an authentic relationship mm -hmm. with a person of color? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. So will you be my friend, Dr. Uh, I'm happy to be your friend. Sure. Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, but, but, happy to be your friend. I won't be. Yes. <laughs> but you know, it's just a small start. I mean, how do yeah. you do yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, one of the ways you can cultivate friends uh, that aren't quite imaginary friends, right? I know I sounded like I have the parents of small kids by talking about imaginary friends. My kids are in college now. But, um, but you know, one of the ways you can do that is by reading Black authors. Yeah. Right? Because, because you'll see different ways that people are talking about their experience. You're getting to understand how they talk about their lives, how they see the world. So if you read... James Baldwin, read Ralph Ellison, read Toni Morrison. I mean, there's lots of authors, right? Uh, but and I would say read, read read a range of people because some people they're just telling you stories and it has nothing specific to do with race, but who they are does include their racial background. Um, because a lot because all the stories aren't always about particularly how somebody experiences a racialized society. But if you have a person who's non-white who's just talking about how, you know, how family life operates. It still helps you, it brings you into some di different dimensions of, oh, there's certain things they talk about that's like in my family. And these things are very different. Uh, and, and so you're just getting to, it's another way to get to know the experiences uh, of, of others. Um, and I guess, you know, yeah, I, I think, uh, I don't think of another author that came to mind. I think Zadie Smith is another interesting author. Um, she, yeah, she's very interesting in a good way. And, and, and the other thing is just resources like this yeah. class. Yes. And yes. resources that are so available and sharing those resources. Yes, yes, yes. And, and I'd say um, it's, it, you know, uh, it, it, it's good to, um, you know, in this multimedia avalanche of information area to, to look at, I would say, different African-American news sources. You see the way that people adjudicate within the black community, certain conversations. So if you went to the root.com, right, you would see a lot of, a, a range of different conversations going on there. And some of them is talking about what's going on in terms of contending with the world. But some of it's also what's happening here so you understand the dynamics that are happening. So like, like you know, a big question that's been perennial in, in certain ways since uh, the civil rights era is, okay, what are the obligations of the black middle class? Right, and really, really it's a question that, that happens with any group that's not in the majority. Right, it's like, it's like reading about second and third generation immigrants. How does the third generation relate to things that differently relate to the country where they're at than people in the first generation. Now they've made it. Now they've got more education. Now they're more careerist, all those types of things. All those types of dynamics, it's interesting the different ways that those things work out. Um, but they're also windows into the ways that some people, they find ways to survive, some to flourish in mainstream society and others, um, somebody who's very successful might say, well, I'm successful, but I'm very successful because of editing myself significantly, All right? And so that's very different than somebody who's never had to think about editing themselves. So you have somebody who's an upper management or is in the C-suite, and um, we say that they're a success. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they would say I'm a success, but it has not been without a cost. And not, not, and not the hard work cost, but also a cost of negotiating spaces that um, required self-editing in order for to, to survive, right? So I think, so reading about ways people talk about those things, uh, I think can, can be helpful. Thank you. Speaking of books, uh, Dr. Baco, um, would you recommend your colleagues, uh, Esau Macaulay's- Oh, absolutely. New book, absolutely. Reading Wild Black? Yes, I would. I would say if you can find it, yes, <laughs> because uh, you know 
they, it's, it's a good example of a very successful launch, mm -hmm. right? It's a very hard book to, to I mean, I think maybe, maybe they're, maybe they have run out of copies again, but the first, you know, the first, you know, flew off really quickly. So I, I definitely would recommend that. Uh, I'd certainly recommend, I think I may mention Michael Emerson and Christian Smith's book, Divided by Faith. Because that, because the chapter on racialization there is a good way to explain the way the dynamics of race have worked out uh, in the United States and and within uh, you know Christian communities. Um, uh, Robert P. Jones has written a book called White Too Long that just came out. He's the head of an organization called the Public Religion Research Institute. Um, I say at very at the very least, a lot of, he, he did a whole lot of newspaper articles that were sort of an preparing to launch the book. Um, I think you at least read those, but the book itself uh, is probably worth reading. Uh, and it's a book that basically says, and I may have mentioned this, but so forgive me if I did, but uh, Catholics, mainline Protestants and evangelicals all together are committed to a uh, kind of um, maintenance of a, of a certain kind of society with a racial hierarchy and organize uh, the Christian faith in a way to kind of keep that in place. That's part. That's one of the, the arguments that he makes. I'm just glad he doesn't say it's only evangelicals. So, so because you know that that's 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 what uh, there's been more people saying that in recent uh, the last four or five years. Mm -hmm. So that's another um, book. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to ask if there's another uh, question um, that anyone wants to jump in and ask in our last few minutes here. Dr. Baco, uh, any? Uh, John uh, unmuted himself. Go, go ahead, John. Uh, we've been doing something at the church for since 2011 that might be of interest to you. Uh, we've been going down to the, the until the coronavirus. We've been going down to the inner city and ministering to uh, ex-convicts or um, drug offenders on a Tuesday night and we bring them food and we share in the worship service with them and we hug them. And it has been an eye opener. Several of the other people on the call have been to this with me. Uh, we can't go now, yeah. but we hope to. But when you get around these people who are probably 80% African American, and you sit next to one of them, you f begin to feel some of the pain. Mm. These are people that you know don't may not have a job, don't have a place to live, um, but their attraction to to God has helped them, mm -hmm. and it has helped us too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm because this is a place to go to really understand mm -hmm. the other people in the world that aren't like people in Wheaton. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think th those are good experiences to have, and they're also good opportunities to inquire about their lives. You know, what's their story, right? What, what, what did opportunity mean for them? Or what, what did they imagine their lives to be like when they were kids? You know what? Uh, because I think a lot, we we don't a lot of times it can be easy to assume you know what that was, and we don't. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity in those types of situations to be one who serves and one who learns as they serve. Um, I think it's also important uh, when you brought that up. Uh, you know what other things can people do? Um, think about your various associations that you've been involved in in terms of what kind of work context. Uh, what kinds of relationships you have to people that are involved in, in, in politics and in community organizations. Um, what are, what, what happens in those spaces that uh, might uh, keep in place, you know, the problems that we're talking about? And what might be a way to begin thinking about uh, having, b being an agent of cultural change in some of those spaces? 
uh, if you, and if you're, if, you, if you're thinking about in terms of, of how you're relating to um, office holders, um, thinking about questions like, well, how do, how do we think about um, the kinds of policies that have, um, you know, uh, not addressed poverty well because they rewarded breaking up families? So how do you begin to uh, to encourage your office holders to be people that pursue policies that are truly committed to helping the poor by facilitating economic opportunity. Um, if you know people that are very much business entrepreneurial types, are they willing to help people to not just learn how to, uh, you know, uh, be entrepreneurs themselves, but are they also willing to be the people who help facilitate capital investment in places that need capital investment? Um, because it can be easy to think, and I'm not saying anybody here is thinking this, but, but it can be easy to think, you know, if people would just, you know, do the hard work, then everything would be okay. It's like, well, some people don't even know what equal opportunity means if, if it's staring them in the face. And they don't know what to do with equal opportunity. And they, and they don't know what to do with capital if somebody gives it to them. So who's going to do that? You know, so who, who's going to do that? Who's going to help them? Uh, to, to help people in, in poor neighborhoods to be able to uh, attend to those things. And that's, a much, obviously that's a, much a class problem as it is a race problem. But that, I think that's something to do is, is to say, well, let me think about where I've worked and what, what kind of people we've been and what our policies were. And even if we had non-discrimination policies, um, what, 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 was, what was our workspace like? Uh, what kinds of things happen? How did people feel like they um, they existed in these workspaces? So, because because somebody determines what the culture of a workspace is, what the culture of an institution is. So, are there things that are, are there things that you can do in terms of agency in terms of those forms of cultural change in certain places? Or are there people that you know that uh, are those people, and you can encourage them to pursue that? Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is, you know, from the individual within our hearts all the way to the international engagements, um, we have to be continually committed to the work of being honest about the perpetual challenge of otherness in general and racism as a species of the otherness problem. Uh, and then thinking about having a courageous, long-term commitment to learning about the multiple facets of how race has worked out and then how can we where we are begin to make at least little differences within ourselves within our our circles of relationships and then the various institutions and other types of associations that we have well we know this conversation will um, continue and uh, Dr. Baco, we so appreciate your helping us to think deeply upon this issue, uh, to think, uh, think about it through our own Christian lens and uh, with the thought to how we can do so um, in, in even more effective ways going forward. So thank you for uh, challenging us, for um, uh, encouraging us, for um, helping us uh, over this last month to, to speak um, on this issue. So thanks for thinking about it also through the lens of our congregation and what we already believe and uh, how we can indeed have a greater witness. So, um, uh, so thank you. I think uh, everyone um, in their own way can give you their own appreciation um, since we are not able to be in person. Right, 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 right. Um, thank you. It's, it, I, I really appreciate it. It's, yeah. it's, it's a privilege to serve. So. And let me also, uh, just by way of reminder, um, say that our adult education uh, elder, Andy Leonard, had put a little while ago a survey in the chat box um, that we'd invite you to take to uh, evaluate this class and uh, give other ideas for uh, future classes that we might hold. And also, uh, by way of a preview, I want to let you know that next Wednesday, uh, we're going to be having a conversation with uh, Dr. James Nader, who's the executive director of the Central DuPage 
Pastoral Counseling Center. As in the month of October, we're going to be uh, focusing on the theme of spiritual um, wellness and mental health in these days of anxiety and ambiguity. So uh, we invite you back for that conversation next week. Um, so thank you again so much for being here. God bless you all and look forward to speaking with you again soon. And thank you so much, Dr. Baycoat. Blessings. Thank you. It's, it's been a real privilege. Blessings, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.